Thank you all for joining us today and this session for Metadata and Focus. Um, and uh, today I'll be joined with Ted Haverman from Metadata Game Changers. Um, but the first uh, the first talk here today is uh, so the session will be in two parts, both of which will explore the uh, important role of data site DOI metadata and its broader impact on the research landscape. So in this first part here, we will showcase uh, specific DOI metadata metrics. I will demonstrate how these can be used as perhaps tools to support uh, informed strategic decision-making and uh, answer some questions and so much more. So today that we're really trying to highlight the importance of metadata quality and completeness and how you can leverage that metadata to support you as a researcher or an institution to enhance your research impact and align with the FAIR principles. And you're going to hear more about that in the second talk from Ted. Uh, but before we dive in, um, a little bit of background here. I, uh, I want to start with uh, answering the question of what is DOI metadata? So the DOI, DOI metadata is the information collected when a DOI is registered. So this includes uh, some essential details such as title, authors, publication date, and this metadata is organized according to the data site metadata schema. So this provides a structured framework that ensures that the metadata is both comprehensive and standardized across different resources and digital objects. Um, so in other words, this this brings a lot of benefits, including um, it ensuring that the resource can be reliably identified and cited. It enhances the discoverability, so it makes the resources visible to services and platforms index research outputs. And it improves the interoperability uh, between systems and platforms, allowing them to work together more seamlessly. Um, so. One important thing as well it does is that your metadata, in doing so, in making the systems talk to each other, the metadata remains compatible with global research infrastructures. So this allows your research outputs to be found and cited and reused on a global level. So lastly, again, the structured metadata directly supports the FAIR principles, which I will leave that to Ted to explore further. But for now, we're going to explore a little bit more uh, the data side metadata schema, which again is specifically designed for data side DOIs. So a quick look at how it's structured. Uh, we have 20 metadata properties with a number of sub properties, and it's uh, they are categorized into mandatory properties. These are represent the minimum information required for a DOI. We have the recommended properties, which should be included whenever possible. That's to provide some richer description. And we have optional uh, properties. And these fields, they may not always apply, so it might not be the case that this, this fits your, your discipline or something else, but they may not always apply, but they can enhance the metadata quality when when they're available. So we really encourage you to, to consider all, all three uh, categories, and we're going to see why that is in later slides. But um, I, I, again, back to the, to the metadata schema, what makes it particularly valuable is the generic nature of it. This allows us to support different types of resources across m all disciplines. So that means that it's flexible and it's not just limited to data sets. So it's adaptable to various research outputs. So anything from software, journals, and more. And if here we, we see what we currently support. We support 30 control list values for research type general. Um, and uh, now we're going to shift to look into to explore some of the type of questions that you can answer using that met metadata that we collect with the DOIs. Um, so wh when we, by analyzing this metadata, we can gain insights into patterns, trends, metrics, 
And the, all of these provide us with a richer and deeper understanding of the research landscape. So you might be asking, what kind of questions can I answer? And for example, which we're going to look at here in the next slides, uh, some of the questions are, what type of resources are being published most frequently? Who are the biggest funders and who are they funding? Um, how much research is being made openly available for reuse? And how are researchers connecting data sets, software, publications, all of these resource types to their or, or to their research output? So how are they building that picture of their research um, project? So these are very valuable insights that help us in assessing the research impact, in tracking collaborations, in monitoring the uptake of open science practices, and much more. Um, but before I go into showing this, I want to highlight that the DOI uh, metadata, data side DOI metadata is openly available under CC0 license, and you can access the, this uh, through our APIs. And you can explore it and um, can look at this insights yourself. But I won't go into details about the API today. I do highly recommend checking out some of our resources to learn how you can access it, how you can work with that information, and um, reach out to us for any questions. But have a look at that. And um, um, now we're going to look at some of the metadata um, insights that we have. So. Uh, to date, we have registered just above 60 million findable DOIs, and each one of them comes with a wealth of metadata. So this is a, obviously a vast collection that enables us to conduct a wide range of analysis. And that, again, provides us deeper insights into the research landscape. So what does it tell us? First of all, I, I want to say that this has not happened in vacuum. This has happened over long time, but you see the growth of the DOI registrations from 2005 onwards, and we see a remarkable upward trend over the past 20 years. So, what, and I'm going to highlight one particular interesting observation here is the significant growth in the number of DOIs in just the last decade alone. So, we've gone from 3.1 million DOIs in 2014 to nearly 61 million in 2024. So this is an impressive 19 and a half fold increase. And it's really, really um, amazing to see. So it's, it's because this reflects the growing adoption of DOIs across disciplines as it highlights the, the importance or the increasing importance of DOIs in the research landscape. So we're really happy to see this and ho hopefully seeing the, the trends continue upward as well. So as I mentioned, the DOIs, uh, the, the DOIs that are registered come with a wealth of metadata. And one of the key metrics that we look at is uh, metadata completeness. So this is the degree to which each property in the schema is filled out for every DOI. And complete metadata is really important for making research outputs truly fair. And again, I'm going to plug here to Ted's talk for later on, so keep your um, eyes out for that. And this graph here breaks down the completeness of each of the 20 metadata properties. So, and as you would expect, the mandatory properties are generally well annotated. So that's great. Um, the completeness of recommended and optional varies a bit more. Um, but again, filling out these fields is not mandatory, but it can substantially enhance the visibility and the reuse potential of the research outputs. So and let's take a closer look at these specific properties and a little bit where improvements could be made. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, the mandatory properties are, uh, are yeah, as you expect, that they're, they all should be there. With the tiny bit of exception here with the research type general, where, um, which is an, a bit of an interesting case, um, you might find like two and a half percent are missing. And you might be asking why that is, or how is this possible given that it's a mandatory property? Well, the reason for this 
goes back to changes that were made in schema 4.0 in 2016, I believe. So before this version, the research type was an optional property and um, probably some older entries don't have this information filled out. And in an ideal scenario, we'd love to see those entries updated and with the, with the, uh, with the missing um, part. Um, but nevertheless, this is quite an impressive number for 97.3%. Um, <laughs> so the completeness is amazing. And we can see why, what does that tell us? So that field in particular allows us to answer question like what type of resources are being published most frequently. Based on the annotated data, the top three controlled vocabulary choices are data sets, text, and samples. We see the same similar pattern in the free text description, which also includes data sets, articles, and individual samples, but there's also a huge portion of records remaining unannotated in the free text is as left as blank. But this might simply mean that there is an in preference for a controlled vocabulary or in incomplete into data. We do not entirely know. But as as, as far as it goes for the um, controlled list, uh, we see um, we see data sets, articles, and uh, physical objects. So um, moving on to the recommended properties. So these overall, they're well annotated, but there are a few areas that could benefit of improvements. So one of those key areas is the contributors field. This field is very, very important because it allows us to track who contributed to the research, um, from authors to data collectors and everybody who's involved in that process. So it's essentially there for two big reasons, for ensuring um, recognition of all efforts and for traceability. So we can understand the full picture of how the research project came together. Um, on a positive note, we see strong completeness in subject and description, despite of them not being mandatory. And this is particularly important because they these two fields are have a key role in enhancing the discoverability and reusability of the resources. So comprehensive annotation here allows research to be found and reused across different contexts. Um, when we look at the optional fields, the levels of completeness is generally lower. And the key example here is the funding reference field, which was introduced in 2016. Um, it's slower adoption really tells us that more needs to be done to encourage researchers and repositories to capture this information and to integrate it into their metadata practices. And I will show you why that is in the next few slides. And if we did have that field consistently filled, it could provide us with a more comprehensive understanding of how financial resources are distributed across global research efforts. So in the next few slides, we're gonna look at why funding information is so important for it to be captured. Um, first of all, because it allows us to answer the question of who are the biggest funders and who are they funding. So this chart uh, shows us the top 10 funders based on the number of DOIs that include funding information. Um, and this gives us insights into the flow of financial support and so on. But here we see the major contributors, including like European Commission, Environment and Nuclear Science Labs, and DFG, which is the German Research Foundation. Is this true reflection of the reality? And here I would like to to uh, for us to remember that this represents just a fraction of the total registered DOI. So this is not a real comprehensive assessment of the funding landscape, but it's rather a glimpse into the funding data that we've captured so far and what it does, what it tells us. So for example, we see the European Commission here appearing as a significant funder, but it only accounts for 1.22 percent. 1.22% of all registered DOI. So this is very, very useful to know. And that's why this is part of like an ongoing effort to improve metadata completeness. Um, 
And the next slide shows us the repositories that contribute that funding information. So in many cases here, what we're seeing is that a particular repository is re responsible for the largest portion of funding information for, for each funder. And, and this tells us that, or indicates that these repositories have both uh, uh, practices in place and a technical infrastructure to in integrate those fields like and it does show a very positive step towards how to capture funding uh, about for better capturing of funding data and we'd love to see more of this uh, obviously um and now to answer the second part of the question of who are they funding uh, by linking that funding information to the researchers' affiliation, we can begin to see how the fun funding is flows between institutions and individuals and so on. So it, it's having that detailed metadata on the authors, on the contributors, and the funders gives us a clear picture of how financial support impacts research outputs and collaboration networks. So this is why, again, like capturing such detailed metadata is very important because it allows us to see the full context, and the impact of the research funding. And I'm gonna shift focus again to other optional fields such as rights. Um, this field is very important for ensuring traceability and accessibility of research outputs. And a common misconception here is that if the data doesn't have a license, it's open for use. In reality, that is not the case. No license is no use. Um, a license is very important for clarifying how the research can be reused. And while this field is not mandatory, it provides a significant value in enhancing the reuse. Um, so, uh, and, and also it supports open science. So for example, we see here the word cloud highlights the most common types of licenses that are used and are captured in the DOI metadata. And we can see a lot of CCs, CC0, CC1, and so on. And these licenses are important for promoting open access and facilitating the reuse of the research data. So that, that's where it aligns with you know, open science principles. And uh, I just want to highlight another important factor here is that the role of standardization. So we see the licenses written in so many different ways. Um, in the metadata schema 4.2, uh, we introduce properties uh, like uh, rights identifier, rights identifier scheme, and scheme URI. So what, the, what does this do? It enables us to use uh, standardized identifiers. So it helps in uniformity and interoperability and all of that and the ways we document rights information. Um, and one, uh, another question that this kind of, uh, this capture rights information allows us to answer is how much of the research is being made openly available for reuse and how are the trends like over time? So the, here we're looking at the changes in license and registration practices over time, highlighting the adoption of more open, more permissive licenses. And I've just, uh, here in the figure legend, you see like the, the top uh, 10 ones that are very permissive, very nice support. So yeah, so very nicely supporting open science. I would love to see more of this information captured in a more standardized way as well. Um, and if you haven't if if you haven't been to this morning session or like the previous I mean today session, I would really recommend you going back and watching uh, Matthias Le first uh, talk about the use of standardized uh, like, uh, rights information. Um, yeah, and now I'm gonna pivot into talking about connection metadata. Um, metadata that I've been talking about so far is how we describe research outputs, but that is not the, uh, all that it does. It also connects them. So connection metadata is the is the um, the metadata that allows us to document the relationships between entities. So imagine if you are working on a project that builds on data from like a previous study. Um, that connection metadata would allow you to trace back through that work. So through that network of outputs through the network of contributors and institutions and so on. So it allows you to have all the context needed for your work. 
Um, and the key feature here is the capacity in, in data science metadata schema is the capacity to create connections with other persistent identifiers, things like ORCIDs and ROARs and you know, other DOIs. Um, so this way we're not, um, we're enhancing interoperability, we're creating a more integrated and transparent and connected research environment. And I'm going to illustrate this with one uh, example here, one of many examples, but um, um, this particular example allows us to see um, a, um, where we consider a registered instrument and the connection metadata allows us to see the relationship this instrument shares with other entities. So for example, here we have things to publications that mention or describe the instrument or method. It identifies the institutes that have either contributed or um, hosting it or um, creating it. So that metadata captures references from other, um, it captures also like other articles that either reference it or basically we, we're, what we're seeing here is that how that research instrument fits into the larger research context. We're, we're looking at its impact and the network of knowledge that it's part of. So um, with that example in mind, I want to just fi finally, you know, summarize everything uh, to and, and, and provide you with some take home messages as well as what you can do to improve, to uh, support this. So DUI metadata matters, metadata matters, and it's a powerful uh, a lens is a powerful tool. It allows us to assess um, not just how much information is there, but also who's doing what and how it's connected and how it evolves over time. And um, through metrics like we've seen today, we can make these connections clearer, so less abstract, turning that abstract metadata into something that is actionable, maybe some actionable insights, something that support um, your your needs and so metadata matters and high quality complete metadata is the foundation of it um it's metadata is also not just about data but about connections and getting that bigger picture um and uh, there are important fields that we shouldn't forget such as rights funders contributors and more i've touched upon only a few of them but these are the biggest ones uh, we want to adopt best practices of metadata to really align with open science, with fair practices, and in general, just to make our research more accessible and reusable. So with that, what can you do? Check your metadata, take a closer look at the completeness of your metadata and your research outputs. Um, are you really capturing all the important fields? Uh, how do your best practices look like? Do you... Um, do, uh, what are you doing to increase your visibility and reusability of your work? And I would go back to say, please use the tools available to explore the metadata insights, such as our data site API, um, tailor it to your needs, customize your queries, let us know what you're looking for and uh, how you got how you got there and what's interesting for you to, to, to know as well. So explore all of this, get in touch with us and uh, all of this, um, uh, figures that you've seen in the presentation are also available in the interactive notebook linked here. So have have a play and let me know how you find it. And before I leave you, I would just well, love to hear a bit more from you on uh, your needs and whether you're actually using data side DOI metadata or not. So please head to our mentee and I'm sure someone's going to add it in the chat in a second. Um, and oh um and let's see uh if we can run okay so uh please head to the mentee and um how do you currently analyze the data side oh, do you actually currently analyze the data side do i meet the data or are you interested in it Um, 
Right. And the second question is, how do you do that analysis? Um, what is most, what, what kind of strat stratification is more important? So how do you look at it by organization, research type or something else? And how do you use that analysis from your work? So if you are doing or interested in doing um, an, an, an DOI metadata analysis, how would you use it? So take your time and, you know, Menti can run in the background, so it's fine. Um, Wonderful. All right. Um, and let us know what other metadata insights are important for you. What would you be looking at? Yeah. And finally, how would you like to access that that those insights um, through our API or expert exports or um, interactive um, notebooks like the one I've shared? Um, so let us know your preferred method. Thank you. Oh, okay. So um, I'm just going to leave that running in the background and uh, go back to the presentation, <laughs> if I can find it. Ooh. Right. Ooh. Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave the Menti running in the background, but in the meantime, I, before, uh, I would like to hand over to Ted Haverman from Metadata Game Changer. So, Ted, take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Let's try this. <clears throat> okay, so does that look like a title? Hello, hello. We can see it all right. Let me see. Okay, great. Okay, thanks, Sarah. That was a lot of interesting, uh, a lot of interesting information there. Um, I'm Ted Haberman, uh, and my partner Aaron Robinson and Metadata Game Changers also uh, is working on similar problems. Uh, and we want to talk today about finding data site bright spots. So the first question might be, what is a bright spot? So. In, in any group of organizations or within an organization, there are always a, a lot of uh, a lot of elements, a lot of members of that organization. Datasite has over three thousand members that are that are uh, headed in various directions, and there's a there's a theory of organizational change called positive deviance, and positive deviance says that in every community there are individuals or groups whose uncommon behaviors and strategies enable them to find better solutions to problems than their peers uh, while having access to the same resources and facing similar uh, or worse challenges. So the idea is there, there are people that are doing uh, things that are moving forward. And um, to move the organization or move the entire community, the community of communities forward, um, the idea is you can identify and differentiate these people uh, who are headed in the right direction, those uh, called bright spots, and give them visibility and give them resources, bring them together and aggregate them. So this is a, a, an idea about how organizations evolve um, that that uh, has been very interesting. Um, and, and I want to think about the work that we're doing with uh, Datasite in terms of it. So um, a number of years ago, working with... Uh, of uh, an NSF project called Metadig and Matt Jones and, and various other people, we created a fair recommendation for data site. And that recommendation is done in terms of um, 
names of documentation concepts. So some of these are obviously uh, connect to, um, well, they all map to the data site schema, but they can also be used with other schema like ecology metadata language or you know whatever metadata schema you're talking about. So um, the, uh, the mapping between these concepts and data site is, uh, is on Zenodo. But we're talking about FAIR. So I think about FAIR as four different use cases. Um, the first two are, are findable use cases. Uh, the second two, in this case, are related to AIR. AIR, uh, the, the air and fair, if you will, uh, has, uh, has fewer uh, elements uh, for each uh, use case because data site has, has really been concentrated on identification and citation. That's why, uh, for instance, this question about rights isn't there. But so this... Um, the, the, the bold and underlying elements here are the mandatory ones. So Sarah showed us that uh, the mandatory fields, which are focused on identification and citation, are really um, obviously uh, uh, present in most of the fields. But this recommendation sort of looks at much more detail and, and combines some of those uh, optional and recommended fields that Sarah showed and actually specific values for some of those uh, code lists that are associated with them. So the first use case, I, I prefer to think of these, or I think about these things as four different use cases, is text, findable text. And this is stuff that happens in Google searches or full text searches. Uh, identifiers are the second use case. So these are the things like, uh, like Sarah show for connecting things to one another, uh, super important. Uh, in accessibility, um, Again, connections come in. Um, connections come in here in accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. So there are connections here, like people that have uh, or papers that have been written about a data set, uh, more metadata, more descriptions, and the final one is context. Because in my experience in data reuses, uh, when you're trying to reuse data, is when you need to talk to human beings, and there are a number of those. So altogether. There are 58 uh, data site elements in this recommendation. This covers quite a bit of the uh, uh, of the data site schema. And so it's really a pretty broad. Uh, there's a couple things. Uh, contributors, for instance, are not included in this um, because there's really a focus. Well, we saw contributors are only in roughly 25% of the records. but and, and so we're looking really at creators here more than contributors. But, but anyway, it's a pretty broad coverage. So when you're looking at these 58 things, the question is, how do you display these? I'm, I'm a visual learner, so I like to look at pictures. So for the findable text recommendation, I use a radar plot. And there are, what I tell you, I think, 15 different fields. And those fields go around the side of this uh, around the, the, uh, the circumference of the circle. So you can see right at the top is abstract and then award title and date created keyword. So this, this is a picture that we can look at. Um, this is from the Doris repository at Uppsala. Uh, it's a, an amazingly uh, complete uh, metadata. It's really a bright spot for findable uh, text in this case, which is called findable essential. Um, the, the scale on this goes from zero at the middle to 100% on the outside. So things, things that, that uh, are at the center of this are, are fields like in this case award title or on the right hand side sort of project funder is a little low. And the ones that are near the outside are the ones that are very complete. So uh, an amazingly complete uh, repository would have this entire circle blue and an empty one would be all white. Um, the reason I use these radar plots is because I want to look at a lot of them at the same time in some cases, or I look at the same, we'll be looking at the same uh, repository through time. So uh, in this case, it has a score. The, the total for this is 79%, uh, which is uh, super good for findable text. Um, so uh, we've talked a little bit about the mandatory fields, and we know that they're 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 everywhere. And so this is this is those four use cases with uh, text text identifiers, connections, and contacts. So Fs are on the top, and errors are on the bottom. Uh, most of the required fields are in the text 
uh, area. So you see a lot of blue and a lot of complete uh, complete things there. We know that these are, are complete. And when you look at the whole total of everything, you end up with uh, 12%. So everybody, uh, everybody, all repositories get a, a score of 12% to start out with because they essentially all have all of the mandatory fields. So we looked at about almost 400 uh, repositories associated with universities and colleges. Um, and the average of all of them looks like this. So we still see uh, over on the upper left here, the, the uh, and in the lower left, the mandatory fields. And then this, uh, the average has abstract. Uh, Sarah mentioned abstracts, one of the descriptions. Um, some resource author types and uh, resource type, which is the full text, uh, some rights in the lower right. But anyway, so the, the average score is 23% um, out of this, this selection of 400 repositories. Now, what we're really looking for is bright spots. So bright spots are those repositories that have high scores. And when I did this work um, back in, uh, in earlier this year, the University of Bath uh, showed up as the, the repository that had the most complete metadata. So you know, I'm just going to go back and forth here a little bit, comparing this with um, the average. And you can see it's much more much more blue than the average has. So abstracts are, are very complete. Uh, funder information, sort of award title or funder, at least things are very complete. And the score here is 46%. So the number to think about is 12% for mandatory fields. That's the base, 23%, sort of a doubling of completeness to average, and then a doubling of completeness to 46. So last week I was uh, I got an email. Well, when I when I found Bath uh, being a bright spot, I sent an email to Alex Ball, who's uh, the research librarian there, and this was in his email response. He's been active. Uh, metadata for a long time. He feels duty bound to ensure that his metadata he creates exemplifies good practices like Sarah was just talking about. And often that feels like an abstract or theoretical ambition. So it's gratifying uh, that the work we're putting in uh, is noticeable and indeed has been noticed. This goes back to that original idea about bright spots and those red arrows out in the community uh, across the 3,000 members of, uh, of DataCite, there are groups that are doing, uh, that are really exploring the all of the capabilities associated with DataCite metadata, rather than just putting in the mandatory fields. And this is what we're uh, hoping to find. And so Alex is really one of those uh, red uh, red arrows. And, um, the, the idea is that not, you know, those are snapshots that we looked at in time, but what we're really in, interested in is continuous improvement of metadata and improving it because you have new uh, metadata fields, you have new identifiers, maybe you get new information. And remember that mandatory and average and bright spot sort of go up uh, the completeness scale. So the question I asked, or the question I wanted to explore <clears throat> is, if we look at these universities now, can we capture sort of multiple multiple snapshots along this uh, this trip to uh, more complete metadata? And um, fortunately, I got I got an email from from Alex last week. And well, when I sent him that email, and he said it was great to be noticed, he also said we're working right now on identifiers for organizations uh, and people in our metadata. And I said, well, please let me know when when that's done, because it's important that, you know, if you're trying to look for this time history, you look, you, you get the beginning, you get a baseline, and then as improvements are made, you can make the same measurements. So this is the measurement that I just showed, the, the 46, which happened uh, earlier this year. Um, and on the right are these scores from each use case. So findable text, findable identifiers, um, air connections and air contacts along the bottom and then total. So we can see Bath as 46% as on the total. And because of the mandatory field being in the text use case, this is a very common pattern. That, that one is um, uh, one of the most, I mean, always the most complete. Um, so I got this email uh, last week and I was able to download the, the new metadata 
it and looked at looked at it, looked at it. So I'm just going to go back and forth here a little bit. Uh, so you sort of get the idea that holy moly, we went from holy moly, uh, we went from 46 to 59. And um, the plot, which is huge, um, the plot on the right, uh, huge in my opinion, shows that most of this increase was involved in two different uh, use cases, findable identifiers and air contacts. So Alex said they're adding identifiers into their metadata. So we expect this in identifiers, in findable identifiers and air contacts. We'll look at that in just a second. But the so the biggest increase was in uh, these two use cases on the right side here. And uh, this is what they look like before. This is what they look like after. And this is the, the, the elements that changed. So resource type, uh, big increase in orchids, big increase in roar. We can go back and forth here, look at these again, and a big increase in, in the contact for the rights holder. So the rights holder is, is the organization that holds the rights for these data. So this is a this is a, a, an increase in completeness of 13%. Um, uh, Bath, in addition to being the, uh, the, the bright spot in terms of the snapshots for overall completeness, also is the, the largest uh, increase that I found. Um, so here's a, a couple others. Uh, King's College, I'm gonna start going through these quickly. Um, King's College before, King's College afterwards. So this is again, a, an increase from right around average. Remember average is around 26 or 20, 24%, something like that, maybe it's 26. So pretty average uh, in, in June and, and now 38, you know, well on their way to be uh, being beyond average or above average. And these are the things that uh, they added in here. Again, orchids and roars, some funder stuff, some affiliations, which is a step towards roars, uh, vocabularies, uh, a big increase uh, at King's College in London. Uh, the University of Leeds, again, uh, a little bit above average in, in June, and then uh, in September, a step from 31% up to 41%. So another, you know, now hopefully you're getting used to sort of what you look for in these pictures, seeing them go go from, from A to B, with B being up that up that ladder of completeness. And then the, the line diagram on the right shows you a little bit about where, where those increases were. So we can see what they did. Um, this one was a little bit different uh, because it really was focused on things that are related to interoperability. So interoperability is data formats and size. If you if you want to be able to tell the uh, the format of the data so you can read it, uh, rights. Um, Matthias talked about it a lot earlier. Uh, Sarah mentioned that rights are in both places. In one case, it's the text. Uh, description of the rights and the other place it's the URI and references are some of those connections between papers and data sets. And references are really important when you're trying to understand data and trying to decide whether you want to reuse it or not. So uh, University of Leeds got a lot of those related identifiers in and their metadata also increased uh, completeness significantly. <clears throat> so just to I'll remind you of what things we can do to move forward here. Um, there's a lot of support for fair data in data site, much more than uh, most uh, most repositories use. Uh, remember that it's important to measure first uh, to create a baseline. So sometimes people say, I want to improve my stuff and then measure it. But if you measure it first and then improve it, you get to demonstrate your uh, your success and 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 measure things and and identify opportunities for uh, things like we saw in those three examples. Um, iteration is clear, start small, uh, select a win, you know, look at the, at the picture, say, gosh, here's something we're missing, let's, uh, let's work on that. And then share successes. So like this talk today, um, sharing those successes, identifying those people that are, that are doing great work and um, sharing their, uh, the benefits of their work and the tools that they're using. Uh, so that's it, and I think we go to questions. Thank you so much, Ted, for that presentation. I do not see any questions. 
Does anybody have any questions to Ted? Um, okay. um, there was a question earlier about uh, rights and changing the uh, yeah. requirement for rights from uh, whatever it is now probably recommended to mandatory. Uh, the mandatory fields have existed um, in data. I'll, I'll answer that. That's okay, Sarah. Um, sort of... uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that these changes are major changes which break the schema, so it requires a major release and also has to go through a um, process of reviewing and um, by the metadata working group and the community. So. We'd love to hear that from you if you can if you can send us your suggestion and we can open that for the community to talk about it. And Ted, you are on the metadata working group, so you can address that from your side. Uh, I wrote a blog a while ago about minimum metadata, and it was a New Year's a New Year's resolution to stop using minimum metadata in a sentence. Uh, those two words together without a use case. So when we look at uh, mandatory fields in data site, it's really minimum metadata for citation and identification, which is the use case that uh, data site has focused on since the beginning of time. Um, you know, rights, there's a number of pieces of rights that are included in the, the other use cases, you know, the text, the, the, the fair use cases that I talked about. And um, so, whether we make it required, you know, I think I think if we have these community recommendations or you know ideas that about what what the community thinks is important for certain use cases, then whether it's mandatory in the schema or not may matter less uh, as people are um, trying to address other use cases like the reuse cases. Uh, rights are very important, and they they will be included. Thank you, Ted. I think this one a question or a comment from Andrea Medina to you. Um, has anyone uh, threaded the betterment or threaded, yes, I would say, examined better metadata to more usage impact? Um, are researchers happy with the minimal metadata? You know, um, one of the ways that I try and judge uh, researcher desires about metadata is by looking at institutional repositories, you know, which are separate than data site, you know, in, but they're run by universities um, and the librarians that work at those institutional repositories do a lot of really important work for um, working with those researchers to explain to them the benefits of more complete metadata and, um, and then how to get that complete metadata in. Um, and so if you if you compare uh, metadata from uh, institutional repositories to the metadata for those same institutions that are in data site, um, you find that the institutional repositories usually have uh, more complete metadata. They have abstracts, certainly, maybe they have keywords, maybe they have rights, maybe they have funder information. They have inf they have metadata that goes beyond um, the uh, the required fields in data site. Um, so, but they're using the, you know, they're using data site for that identification and citation use case, which means give me a DOI as many times as quickly as possible with the least amount of metadata possible. So, um, you know, I think, I think that the, the institutional repositories do a great job of working, of representing us metadata geeks with those researchers and convincing or explaining to them the benefits of better metadata, but then it's what gets shared with data site that it's that sharing step that's controlled by tools in some cases and also uh, reflected in how, how we think. Um, and, and so only a small amount of the metadata that exists, and we've demonstrated this um, in a few cases, only a small amount goes to data site. So yeah, I think there's I think there's uh, good use cases for or good examples of of benefits. 
and um, things like data site commons and tools for seeing these connections between things between things are also um, improving that now. Okay, thank oh, you so much. Use and we, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm um, just being mindful of time and I want to share um, the last, uh, I want to encourage everybody to um, uh, to sign up if you haven't already to our uh, last uh, session of the day, uh, the Bridging Gaps and in Open Infrastructures. And it's right after this one, uh, so stick around and um, please feel free to attend it. And with that, um, would also um, love to would all we'd also love to have your feedback. So please, on your way out, answer the three question follow up poll because we do take that feedback to heart and uh, we act on it. So uh, thank you so much for that, and I would. Really appreciate it. Um, um, if if you can uh, take the time to answer this, thank you for attending today's session, and thank you, Ted, for being our speaker today. And oh. uh, I would. Sarah, one other thing I wanted to say: if you uh, if you're on this seminar, or you know someone who's who might be interested in trying some of these tools on uh, a data site uh, repository that they're working on. Um uh let me know. You've got my email, it's in the in the slides. And um, you know, we're looking for people that and repositories that want to explore these capabilities and see how they might be helpful. So let me know if you're on that list and thanks everybody for, for listening. Thank you all for today. That's it. Um thank you. Bye.